I'm done. I don't know. <laughs> he already he already knows all the answers. Uh, it's, this it's it's always tough to 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 you know do a, a pre pre interview and not talk about things that oh we want to talk about you in the interview but like, we'll cover a lot well, of the same ground before so. Yep. I don't know. I don't know. I can turn that off. I think we may need also shut. All right. Let me first of all it'll just start with the official part and let me let me get your name on the tape so. You know who we're uh, talking to? My name is James Stolmeyer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born and raised in Covington, Kentucky, across the river from Cincinnati, uh, which will help people locate it. And I came here in July of 1944, and uh, except for a three-month interlude, I've been here ever since. Let's, let's start. I mean, we talked a little earlier about uh, your time in high school, and and. During high school, it was was the time when when the war began. I, I, I take it, or maybe my, old, little... my oldest brother was drafted in early 1941. The second one was drafted in 42, and the third one was also drafted in 42. So obviously, you were probably thinking as a high school student, you know, what 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 happens. What happens to you at that time? Well, I was going to be 18 in August of 1944, and I knew that I would be in the service. Uh, I would get my orders uh, during that summer, as several of my classmates did. Uh, so in the spring of 1944, I decided to enlist in the Navy. And since I was at that time uh, in the engineering curriculum at the University of Dayton, uh, the Navy had me take an examination, and when I got my orders, I was ordered to report to the Navy unit at the University of Illinois. That's the uh, that's the total of the description which I received. You were mentioned that you were able to take an examination. What uh, was this was an elective? This is something you could have done, or and what would have what would you have done otherwise? Uh, if I hadn't taken the exam, I would have gone wherever the Navy sent me, uh, just as any enlisted person did. I mean, the exam was not a guarantee that I would go to the college program. It was, uh, as a matter of fact, I took the exam and I enlisted in the Navy. Then I waited and they said, you'll get your orders. And so my orders came and told me to go to Urbana, Illinois. Mm -hmm. what, were you th what did you think at that time? Uh, when, when you got your orders, uh, and, and, and what had you known of, of Urbana-Champaign before that? I knew nothing of Urbana-Champaign. I didn't know of the University of Illinois. Uh, and so uh, I got on the train in Cincinnati at about 11 p.m. on June the 30th, uh, traveled to Indianapolis, made a change in train, uh, arrived in Urbana at what is now the Station Theater at about 8.15 uh, on the morning of July the 1st and asked a taxi driver to take me to the Navy unit at the University of Illinois, uh, which he didn't know the location of, and so he took me to the administration building on Wright Street, which is where I was dropped. Uh, July the 1st, 1944, happened to be a Sunday so that there were no offices open and few people around at 8.15 in the morning on Sunday. So I started to roam around the campus and onto the quad until I ran into a Navy person uh, who told me to go to Busey Hall, which traditionally had been a girls' residence hall, but at that time was occupied by the Navy unit, Busey and Evans. So. You you got to Busey and uh, what was what was the situation there? What was uh, was it was it pretty much a, a barracks at that time? How how were the living arrangements? We lived in the rooms just well. No, I won't say the same as they are today since they're they've both been redecorated. But we lived in the regular residence rooms uh, with a community bathroom. Uh, I lived on the east wing of Busey. Uh, which, which had about nine rooms, uh, so there were 18 of us, uh, two, no, I'm sorry, there were 20 of us because the end room had four, had, had two double bunks, 
Uh, the four rooms on each side had double bunk, so we were four rooms of two on each side and a room with four at the far end and one bathroom and that's where we lived and uh, we had meals in the basement of Evans Hall which I believe is still used as uh, the eating the, the dining room for the residents of Busey Evans today. And, and these were all young men who were in the same situation as you who had, who had taken the exam and all Navy they were all Navy yes all young men from the Navy uh, some like I uh, this was where they were sent first uh, people who were in the fleet at that time were eligible to take an exam to see whether they could get into the program so there were people uh, in the unit who had come from the fleet so it was a kind of a mixture of sailors and, and civilians <laughs> in Navy uniform. So that must, must have been interesting. I mean, as a college student, obviously you went to college and you interacted with people who came from different backgrounds, but this was probably something altogether different. Well, it was a unique arrangement because we had, uh, we had regular Navy activities. I mean, we had calisthenics, which we had to do, and we had to have marching. Uh, and we had to take courses in all the Navy programs, learn all the semaphore signals and everything else in addition to taking our engineering classes. So was, was basic training, your, your, sort of your basic training in the Navy was held here as well? Oh yes, we marched uh, behind Busey Evans. At that time, uh, it was a big open field except for Freer Gym, the, the present athletic facility which is east of Freer Gym was not there. It was a big open field and and that's where we marched and ran and we used Freer Gym as our gym and did rope climbing and uh, we had uh, swimming in uh, Huff Gym in the old pool. I don't know whether, it's, I suppose it's still there. The pool which is uh, seven feet deep so you couldn't touch bottom and that's where we had all of our swimming lessons. So you learn Navy life hundreds of miles away from, from the nearest body of water. Right. As I tell all of my relatives, I was a dry land sailor. <laughs> tell me, you, you, we talked about this, but uh, you know, what, what was a day, a day in the life on campus like at that time? Well, for us, uh, it was pretty much dictated. We rose at 6. Uh, Reveille was at 6 a.m. Uh, we had to assemble for calisthenics, which went until about 6.30. Uh, exercises, running. Uh, at 6.30, we were dismissed from that to do whatever we had to do, uh, clean up and have breakfast. And then we assembled at 7.30 for what at that time was called muster, essentially roll call to make sure everybody was there. Uh, and then after roll call, we were dismissed to go to our classes and follow our regular academic program. And at that time, we were required by the Navy to take a minimum of 18 credit hours, which meant that we were in class 26 to 28 hours a week. Classes ran from 7 in the morning until 5 in the evening, Monday through Friday, and 7 to noon on Saturday. Uh, after classes, we had dinner. The evenings were athletic activities or study, as you wished. Taps was at 10 p.m. Uh, and the uh, corpsman would come through the halls to make sure everybody was in bed with the lights out. And so th that was the end of the day. So our day ran from 6 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night with classes and study, and that was pretty much it. How much different is that from, from what, what, what a civilian may have uh, been going to at school at that time, you think? Well, a uh, civilian could take whatever program he wanted. Uh, of course, there weren't many civilians in the engineering program, so we didn't, uh, we didn't run into, the classes were 
for the most part, all Navy personnel, mm -hmm. maybe one or two civilians, but they lived in their quarters and we were isolated in Busey Evans. Uh, and so most of our friends were Navy personnel. But you took some courses that were, you, you mentioned it was the general college curriculum, so you took a lot of other courses. We took the regular engineering program, English, history, economics, uh, you know, of course chemistry, physics, that's all part of engineering. But we had the regular, the, the regular program. The program was, the, the academic program was not dictated by the Navy. It was simply that we went through the program, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, ceramic engineering, whatever engineering discipline you happen to be in. And what were you in? I was in civil engineering. And uh, so that's where I spent my time, civil engineering. At that time, all the classes were in the old engineering hall, directly across from the union building. And, and how might that, uh, you know, that training have been different from a, you know, what, a, what, what training a, civ a civil engineer would go through in civilian times? What kinds of, was there specific military civil engineering? No, training? no, no, no. It was, a, it was the regular standard academic program. Mm -hmm. uh, there, were no, there were no special courses uh, because they were the Navy program. How much interaction did you have, uh, as, you know, taking some of those general college courses along with the engineering, how much interaction did you have with other, other students? Before? None. My economics class was all Navy personnel. The, <laughs> All, all of the classes were Navy personnel. I don't know what, I don't know that the civilians were exempted from our sections, but uh, we never had any with us for whatever reason. Did Maybe, you interact out of class at all? Very rarely, because there wasn't much time. A few, of the, a few of the Navy men found local girls, uh, but uh, not very many for the most part. It was pretty much an isolated program. When was there a chance for interaction at all? I mean, passing between buildings during the day or, or social activities or anything like that? There weren't many social activities during the 1944 to uh, 46 uh, during that period. None that I, I don't recall any sponsored dances or anything of, of that sort. What did you and your your colleagues do on weekends? Played football in the winter time. Played baseball in the summer time. Uh, played basketball. When when I first came here, there had been a signal corps group, uh, which was quartered in what is Kenny Gym. There was a diesel school, which was quartered in what at that time was known as the men's residence hall, directly west of Huff Gym, and we were in Busey Evans. The, the, the signal school had been disbanded. The diesel school was still here, and so we were quartered in Busey and Evans. When the diesel school was disbanded, then we were moved from Busey Evans to uh, the men's residence halls across from uh, Huff Gym. And uh, that's it. What was your question? No, well, we social going? activities. What, 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 uh, what things you did over the weekend, you, you, considering you had to stay. We had in, to stay the within cities. the confines of Champaign Urbana, uh, which pretty much restricted our activity. Uh, some people have asked me whether we went to Rantoul, and I said, no, most of the people who were at Chanute came to Champaign-Urbana uh, because during the war years, uh, there were probably twice as many girls on campus as there were men, and therefore there was no reason for the men from Champaign-Urbana to go to Rantoul. Uh, it was rather the other way around that the airmen from Chanute came to Champaign-Urbana because they knew that there were a lot of available girls. Still, there so, wasn't too much interaction. So there was very, very little interaction. We had few civilians in our classes. Uh, our regimen was pretty much dictated by the Navy. I mean, when you had 28 hours of classes uh, during a, essentially a 44-hour week, uh, there was not a lot of downtime. 
and when the lights went out at 10 o'clock, uh, there was not a lot of time for social activity. It made for a pretty serious campus, I would bet. It was a very serious campus, I would say, much different than today, uh, because uh, if you, I mean, you knew that at 10 o'clock the lights were going to go out and you had to be in bed or you were going to be in trouble. Consequently, three hours during the day were you had to use those for studying when you were taking 18 hours. So if you had a free hour from classes, uh, you didn't do a lot of socializing. You mostly went to the library and did more studying. Was that uh, because of the, the era, perhaps? Or was it just because, uh, you know, what, 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 what kind of no. discipline was there as far as? Well, the, dis the, the discipline was that if you did not satisfy the program, there was no such thing, at least within the Navy program, there was no such thing as probation as we have it today, so that if you don't make your grades, you get another semester's grace to try to bring them up to par. Uh, if you didn't make the grade, you went to the fleet. So people have said, well, you weren't really in the Navy. Well, I was in the Navy. I, did, I went where they told me to go, and I, I did what they told me to do, and if I hadn't been able to satisfy the program, I would have ended up someplace else in the fleet. Uh, and that was entirely up to the Navy to make, to make that decision. And, and by in the fleet, you mean uh, on a ship or? On a ship or at some other Navy base, Norfolk, you know, San Diego, San Francisco, uh, wherever they had, wherever they had a Great Lakes, where they had a big Navy program. Or possibly seeing action. Or possibly seeing action. Because I had classmates, high school classmates, who did see action in the Pacific War uh, in the Navy, who were, who were drafted into the Navy after I enlisted. What was, what was it like knowing that uh, while you're taking courses that there were, you know, that there was the possibility that you or some of your colleagues could see action eventually? Or, no, or they... uh, it was taken as a, taken for granted. It was never, n never a big worry. I mean, you just did what you had to do and let the chips fall where they may. That's, mm -hmm. So there was no anxiety. It was just doing, you know, going to class and doing your best, and that was it. What was... Uh... I mean, we talk about the physical setup of the campus at that time. Uh, even even physically, I guess uh, your groups were were separated. There weren't there wasn't interaction between civilians and very and very little. No, mm -hmm. the uh, we it was pretty much traveling between the residence hall and and the campus, and that was pretty much it. Tell me a little about some of your some of your colleagues. And you, you, you mentioned all coming from different backgrounds and some from the fleet. Well, that, yeah, very good friend. Uh, the first unit that I was in, the first company that I was in, we had uh, a local boy. He was actually from Champaign-Urbana who had been in the fleet and had been to sea and took the exam, and he was back. Uh, in our group, there were... Uh, Three, three men from New York. My roommate was from uh, Ely, Minnesota. Uh, several people from Alabama. It was a, it was a mix, a mixed bag. Did you hear of some of the previous experiences that some of the people that were in the fleet uh, had had? No, they never talked. They nobody talked much about it. It was you, you, you didn't talk about past history. <laughs> At that time, it was pretty much uh, to do what you had to do, and that was it. Did you know what kinds of things you might have been doing, had, you know, once once leaving the school when you were when you were taking civil engineering? Was it, or was it just sort of? Well, the the program that we were in, uh, the civil the civil engineer. Uh, 
the civil engineering program was directed to produce engineers for what was called the Civil Engineering Corps, the Seabees, which was the construction arm of the Navy. Uh, those were the people who predominantly ended up in the Pacific uh, building airfields on uh, the islands that the Marines and the Army uh, freed up and then they would go in and and build uh, barracks and airfield for the for the Navy and for the Air Force so the objective for me was to get into the Civil Engineer Corps were there typical class or were there classes of people who would leave all at once or were they, did people get individually called in this oh no as you as was? you graduated uh, you went to the fleet uh, the the program that I was in, called the V-12, the engineering program, was initiated in 43. Uh, people who came into the program, some graduated in 44, and then they went to the fleet and went wherever the Navy sent them. Some graduated in 45 and did the same thing. Uh, the program was disbanded in the summer of 1946 and we were all discharged at the convenience of the government. And my Navy career ended. <laughs> Very quickly, I guess. Very quickly. What was that like? I, what, what, did they just hand you a piece of paper? How, how, how did all that work? I mean, t we, between the end of the war when you knew that, that, that things would wind down. And well, we went by truck from the men's residence halls to the railroad station, and we went by train from there to Great Lakes. And for some reason, we had to go to Great Lakes to be uh, discharged. Uh, and we were discharged from the Great Lakes Naval Station, and then we were just told to go our own way. So after discharge, I went to downtown Chicago and caught a train and went back to Cincinnati, back to civilian life. Did you have an idea what you, what you would do uh, or, or, or how long? How much longer you would be in the service once the war ended? Did you give any thought to what civilian life would lead for you then? No, uh, no. Uh, I guess as far as I was concerned, I was in the Navy and I did what the Navy told me to do. And they just told me to stay here and go to school. And finally, when the program was disbanded, they said, you're being discharged. And that was it. You talked earlier about the, 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 the Army School being on campus at the same time and, and not knowing too much about that no, school. No, there was a program called ASTP, right. Army Specialized Training Program. Uh, they were housed in Newman Hall, which is on Armory Avenue uh, by, by the library. Uh, they did their thing and we did our thing. The, there were no Army people in our classes. I, ha I have no idea what the Army program was for. Uh, all I know is they were here, and that program was disbanded in 1945 when the war in Europe ended, and they all departed. Was there any rivalry, Army-Navy rivalry on no. campus at all? No, no, and no, very, very little interaction. I, I didn't know any ASTP then. But you also mentioned that, that the Navy uh, pretty much kept up the traditions of that, that college football games. Well, uh, yeah, there were not many musicians, I suppose, on campus, so the, the Navy uh, made up the band for the football team. Uh, when I say they made up the band, uh, at 168 people, there were perhaps 40 instruments uh, and the other 128 were marchers. And the Navy personnel constituted the band and made all of the formations for the football games. And on at least one year, uh, Chief Illini Weck was a member of the Navy unit. And several members of the football team were uh, Navy men. Uh, and several Navy men were also part of the basketball teams during those years. It must have been a different atmosphere at those games in wartime than there would have been any other time. Well, there weren't many people there, uh, maybe 25, 30,000. The stands were pretty sparse. Uh, 
but it was, it was still fun. We didn't win many games because many of the football players who had been on the football team here uh, when they got into the service for one reason or another, many of them ended up at Purdue. And uh, when Purdue came over here to play, we were essentially playing against our own personnel who were now students at Purdue. And that changed again, you said some of them That changed came back. again when the war ended, they came back specifically, uh, oh, I don't remember all of their names. I remember specifically Alex Agassi, uh, who had been here before the war, went to Purdue, played at Purdue, and then came back after the war and played here. Eventually ended up as the coach at Northwestern. But he was one of those. You were talking about um, you know, the, the atmosphere on campus when you were there. And I think you said there were about 14,000 About 14,000. What had changed in the time when you, between when you left to get discharged and when you came back to campus and, and started uh, uh, you know, with, 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 yeah, as a civilian student? Well, the, the veterans started to come back in 1945. When, after the war in Europe ended. Uh, by 1946, there were many veterans on campus. Uh, Kenny Gym was a residence hall. The, the gym was a series of bunk beds. Where they studied, I know not. Uh, the ice rink was another dormitory. The ice rink itself was the floor was covered with bunk beds, doubles or triples. Uh, and the rest of the veterans lived wherever they could. Anybody who had space rented out rooms, including their basements. Uh, and west of the stadium, since there was nothing between the stadium and the railroad tracks, uh, from First Street to the railroad tracks and from uh, Peabody to Gregory were prefabs where the married veterans resided in Illini Village. So could you tell the difference? Uh, I mean, was there a noticeable, noticeable difference in, in just the, the feeling on campus uh, before and after? Well, it was, it was a difference in the feeling. Uh, no, because when I came back in 46, I was still only 19 years old. Uh, the returning veterans were, and I was single, uh, the returning veterans were 24 or 25 and they were married. Uh, and so they had their own responsibilities. And let's put it, it's a little more serious. I would say uh, when the veterans started to return, it was still, it was still a very serious campus because they had time to make up and they were not about to participate in any social activities, I mean, except among the married families who lived all in a, in a neighborhood. Uh, there was very little interaction between the married veterans and the single veterans. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a much different atmosphere than it is today. How was the transition from military life on campus to civilian life on campus? Well, you didn't get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and you didn't go to bed at 10 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> that was probably the biggest change <laughs> for you me. Were, you felt a little freer? or uh, what, uh, Oh, what was certainly, it? certainly, absolutely. Uh, although I did continue in the Navy program in, the, when I, in my senior year in the Naval ROTC, and... Uh, when I graduated in 1947, I was commissioned in the Navy, in the Civil Engineer Corps, so that I was still subject to being called back uh, for, many, for many years. So and the military still had a big presence on campus well afterwards. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The, Arm, the Navy program was here. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, there had not, there had, the Army, obviously, the ROTC program 
goes back to, I know not when the Army program started, but there was always an ROTC program on campus. But there had never been a Navy ROTC. The Navy ROTC unit on our campus started in 1946 with the dismissal of the V-12 program. And so a, n a number of us, those who came back, uh, a, a majority of us continued in the NROTC and got our commissions in 1947. Uh, and then we were essentially eligible as veterans to be recalled whenever the Navy needed us. Okay, just a second. That's okay. okay. So right, that well, when you, in, a, in addition to learning how to swim, you had to learn how to survive. Uh, so you were, they had a, I don't know how tall the tower was, 15 feet. You had to jump off with all your clothes on and take your pants off and tie knots in the legs and throw them back over your head and try to make a, an air pocket so you could use it as a life jacket. Uh, you had to practice uh, swimming under oily water that might be on fire, so you had underwater back and forth. You were permitted, <clears throat> you were supposed to come up twice in 25 yards, so you would swim 25 feet and come up and take a breath and swim 25 feet underwater and come up and keep doing that for 30 minutes. Uh, or you had your hands tied behind your back and jumped into the pool and you had to s survive and stay above water because you couldn't touch bottom uh, for 30 minutes uh, until you were told you could were allowed to touch the side of the pool. And so you learned all the same things. You just didn't do it. You didn't do it in the ocean or in the lake. You did it all in that seven foot pool. It, at you Huff did Hall. it all in the Huff Gym pool. What other kinds of uh, training maneuvers did you do on campus, and, and, and where were they done? And did you go off campus for any of those types no, of things? No, we never went off campus. We had drill uh, and, and calisthenics, and we had rope climbing, which we did in Freer, because uh, I don't know what Freer gym is like now, but at that time it had uh, an open floor and about a 25-foot ceiling, and the rope was hung from the rafters, and you did rope climbing up and down uh, so that was about it so the the basic training that you would have gotten elsewhere was all done here on campus it was all done on campus yes and, 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 and with the facilities you had and not with an ocean and <laughs> and in addition to the engineering courses we had navy courses we had to learn semaphore uh, we had to learn all the ship directions and all that good stuff you know where the red light was and where the green light was and, and what the flags meant and all the all the semaphore signals yeah we had a, we did that all on campus a lot of people from were from outside the midwest correct oh yeah we had from people from the east coast to the west coast and i had classmates from california uh, and they went from the canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. They were from all over the country. And they all had to get used to Illinois winters and learning naval exercises well, and we, swimming yeah, pool it, and all that. Yeah. Well, it was different. I can tell you, coming from Kentucky, I couldn't believe it when I got to Illinois and realized that, you know, in, in Kentucky, if you can see 300 feet over the hill, why, you're lucky. But when I came to Illinois and saw that you could see for 10 miles with, you know, Without anything in the way, it's quite a it's quite a transition. <laughs> when the I recall the first time I a friend lent me his car in 1945 when I had leave and I drove to Cincinnati and at that time I I used to go down to Route One Route 36 which goes through Tuscola on its way to Indianapolis and of course it's straight as a string and you can put the pedal to the metal and and at that time the speed limit was reasonable and proper which meant that you could do whatever you you could go as fast as you wanted to go as long as it wasn't improper 
what did you get to know about uh, Champaign Urbana, for example, outside campus? Uh, what was what was? Not much, not much. Champaign Urbana didn't mean a whole lot to me uh, at that time. So there wasn't. Uh, you mentioned not much interaction among students, but n any interaction inside town or anything no, like that. no, not at all. Did not at all. Go to the theaters at all, or went to the Virginia and to the Rialto, which used to be uh, on Church Street in where Robeson's department store used to be. I forget what they call it now, but there was a theater there called the Rialto. Uh, the one in Urbana was called the Princess on Main Street. Uh, yeah, we went to the theater lots of times. <laughs> and and you, I mean, Saw civilians there, saw, saw residents, townies, I guess. We saw and, townies, but uh, I don't know. At least I, I never got acquainted with any townies because uh, they didn't come to the campus unless they were students, and we didn't roam about town uh, because we didn't have all that much free time. You did mention you, you, you were supposed to stay in the Champaign-Urbana area, but uh, there, we were, there were times when <coughs> we were the rules were bent. We were confined to the Champaign-Urbana area unless we had papers to leave. However, I mentioned that uh, there was a man in our unit who was from Champaign-Urbana, and several of the people got to know young ladies from Champaign-Urbana whose parents had automobiles. So it was possible to go off limits, provided you didn't get caught, uh, which was not likely because there were no MPs roaming around Illinois looking for Navy personnel. So on occasion, we would uh, go over to the strip mines on the south side of Route 150. On the north side, it's now called Kickapoo, but on the south side, we called it Kickapoo, but it's all strip mines, and we slide down the cliff and go swimming in the strip mines and go over to the Boy Scout camp which is still there then back and forth through the strip mines till we got to the Boy Scout camp and then use their diving board and then when we got tired we'd swim back to the cliff and go back up and get in the car and come back home so that was that was a big that was a big outing that was the extent of mischief too that was the extent of mischief you were Okay, I, th I thought thought I mentioned something. Ah, okay. Um, did you meet your wife here? I met my wife here, but not until 1952. Oh, okay. That was not during the war. I met her in 52, and we were married in 53. Mm -hmm. so. But you had been here, I mean, you, after you came back to campus, you never left, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, only time I, the only time I left was when I graduated in 47 and took a job with the Southern Railway who sent me to Tennessee on a construction job. Uh, but then I got noticed that I had an appointment to go to graduate school and I came back in September and started graduate school in September of 1947 uh, and have been here ever since. And even when you came back, it was a, a different, a, maybe a different school, different character than when you, when you left. Oh yeah, because by that time, uh, we were all civilians. There were no, there were no military people on the campus after that, and so now we were free to live wherever we wanted and make our own schedule for whatever we wanted to do. Do you think somebody who who went to school now or went to school in the recent past uh, would, would recognize the campus of 1940, 44, not, 45? Not, not hardly. Uh, engineering, let's see, the engineering campus, uh, engineering hall was there, uh, electrical engineering research lab to the north of that, and Talbot Lab, which is still there, was here. The present electrical engineering building was built after the war. Uh, the old, the, the present, I guess it's metallurgy building on the corner of Green and Matthews uh, was the physics building at that time. The, the, new, the new ME 
building was built after the war, the new physics building, Loomis uh, physics building was built after the war. And uh, except for Kenny Jim, there wasn't anything uh, north, there wasn't anything north of Springfield. Kenny Jim is the only thing that was there. Uh, because the, behind Kenny Jim was a railroad, well, uh, not a railroad, a running track because that's originally before Memorial Stadium was built, that was where the football games were played. And north of that was the baseball diamond, where Beckman Institute is at the present time was the baseball diamond. And uh, that, was, that was it. I mean, then south, uh, the library was, well, I guess the Commerce Building was there, uh, and the Ag Building, but, uh, and of course the Armory. And, and this was all before the military was integrated, too, correct? Yes. yes. Were, were there any African-American units or other units uh, on, on the U of I campus at all, or students no. or anything like that at no. that time? I don't, I don't recall, I'm perfectly honest, I don't recall any African-American students mm -hmm. during that year. I don't, I don't know when they started. Mm -hmm. uh, probably 19... See, I'm trying to think. Uh, I recall a grad student, I know, not, probably about 1949, very, a, a relatively small number. But it was quite, quite a small number, I would Unheard of before that yeah. on, on the campus. Very, very few African Americans yeah. on the campus. Um, well, uh, any, any last things that you may want to, to, to in part about uh, about your experience on the campus during no, the war I years was, of what I, I all I can say is that I think that I was very fortunate uh, because as I mentioned my eldest brother had already been injured and was in the hospital uh, my second brother was in the Air Force and had been in, he was in Africa uh, and then after we chased the Germans out of Africa he was in Italy at an Air Force base. My third brother was in the combat engineers and as of the day I graduated from high school, unbeknownst to us, his unit was in the D-Day invasion on Omaha Beach. Uh, and so I figure that I was pretty fortunate. Of course, they were all fortunate. They all survived. Uh, the one in the infantry, as I mentioned, had been injured. Uh, and spent some time in the hospital, but my brother in the Air Force survived without any difficulty. My brother, who was in D-Day, survived without any difficulty, uh, except that they lost three or four years of their life, whereas I was fortunate enough to spend two years in the Navy and complete three years of college education because we went to school 12 months out of the year. Uh, we went to school 16 weeks, had a week off, 16 weeks, had a week off, 16 weeks, had a week off. How the faculty survived, I have no idea. Uh, and we were, because we were off on, we had no classes on the 4th of July or Thanksgiving or I suppose Memorial Day. But other than that, and of course, uh, Christmas, uh, Easter, which happened to be on a Sunday, so there were no classes on Sunday. But other than that, we had classes. They just went right straight through. But it felt almost as much like a job as it did a It was a, a job. It career. was a job. And, then, and so I have always, you know, people say, well, you didn't really, you weren't really in the service. I say, well, I was and I wasn't. I was subject to Navy orders. Uh, I had to do what they told me to do. But I felt that I was very fortunate to be able to, to and <clears throat> to add to that, I guess for some people this would be, uh, what do you call it, uh, adding something to something. I was, despite the fact that I was in school for two years and completed three years of college, I got the GI Bill when they discharged me, so I got two more years of free education. So it turned out well. Can't beat that. Uh, probably the most profitable military service that I can imagine. Okay. okay.
Anybody else have? I think that'll do it. Very good. I enjoyed it. Thanks for.